Welcome. Admiral, how are you today? Well, I'm fine. Thank you. My name is Mark DePue. I'm the Director of Oral History at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. Today is Monday, March 20th, 2017. And as you know, we're in the museum, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum. And I know that has a special place in your heart, Admiral. Absolutely. I'm a, a native of Springfield since 1940, so uh, I know about Abraham Lincoln. You grew up with Abe. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm a little bit older than he was, but not much. <laughs> well, you grew up hearing the stories about Lincoln, I should say. Uh, Admiral, just a little bit about your background, and I'm going to turn it over to you. 1954 graduate of the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, spent the bulk of your career in, with submarines, started on a diesel sub, so the old-fashioned type, but then you got into the nuclear fleet, and much of your story, and you and I have had many discussions, as uh, you know already, but the things that always fascinated me about your, your life and your stories was all of the experiences you had with Admiral Hyman Rickover. But I know you're very proud of your command of the USS Plunger, an attack submarine. Those were great stories. And you had plenty of other experience with submarines. Uh, commanded the entire boomer fleet in the Pacific, as I understand. Or, and yes. Then, mm -hmm. And then uh, the entire submarine fleet for the Pacific. Yes. Which is quite amazing. But our story today, since this is all about the, uh, the uh, HMS Titanic, is your stories about that. And so let's pick it up with asking you what you were doing in 1981 through 1985. Well, I was the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Submarine Warfare from 1981 to 1985. And uh, I was in the Pentagon. Uh, <clears throat> And that's the time frame that we planned and we funded a top secret operation, an operation to go out uh, to the sites where two submarines had been lost in the 60s. In uh, 1963, the Thresher uh, went down uh, about 100 miles or so off of Portsmouth. And uh, in 1968, the uh, uh, Scorpion went down as she was returning from a patrol about 200 miles west of the Azores. Uh, Thresher had 168 soul, souls on board uh, Scorpion 99. There was quite a loss. Were these both nuclear subs? Uh, both nuclear submarines. Uh, Thresher was a brand new fast attack uh, nuclear submarine, the fastest, the deepest diving and uh, Scorpion was a, was a fine submarine. I had, in my career, served uh, on uh, Plunger, as you said, which was a sister ship of Thresher. And then I served on the Snook, which was a sister ship of the Scorpion. So I knew a lot about these submarines. And uh, so when I came to the Pentagon, I wanted to look into, you know, what had happened, uh, if there was any new information, we didn't have any information on Scorpion. We knew about Thresher because when she went down, we'd had a support ship in the area. And so we knew where she was. And subsequently, uh, she was exam the site was examined by a submersible. But uh, the, the Scorpion went down and uh, nobody knew where she was except we were able to determine where she was using a special sonar system in the Atlantic, uh, listening posts around the Atlantic to detect Soviet submarines moving through the Atlantic. And when Scorpion uh, sank, she imploded. Uh, that's a pretty big noise. And the, the system, which was called SOSIS, was able to, to triangulate on her. So we knew where she was. Just if I could interject here real quick. Sure. I wonder if you can just spend maybe a minute or two and tell us what it was like serving on these submarines in the 1960s. Well, it was a, it was a, a difficult time for us. We, uh, we were nose to nose with the Soviets all over the world. Our attack boats, our fleet ballistic missile submarines, of course, were at sea, ready to launch within 15 minutes. Uh, we were uh, submerged. Uh, the entire time for 60, 70 days. Uh, it was, it was uh, a, a lot of uh, stress on the young people. The submarine force was growing. 
they were building about eight submarines a year, uh, Polaris submarines and uh, nuclear attack submarines. And uh, it was tough on the people. We, uh, well, I, I can recall spending uh, 300 days uh, at sea underway in 1970. And uh, so it was a tough time on us. I, uh, uh, of course, uh, was very interested in Thresher because I had been in a, a boat just like her and had some similar problems to Thresher. The, uh, the operation that we planned was a top secret operation. Uh, it uh, consisted of going to the site of the Thresher where she went down and examining the site using special cameras and equipments, uh, a sled moving along the bottom, controlled from a surface ship. And uh, the uh, same operation for the Scorpion, examine the sites, uh, determine if there's uh, any radio radioactive uh, material there. You know, there was a, a reactor at each site uh, that went down. There were two nuclear-tipped uh, torpedoes, weapons, that went down with the uh, Scorpion. So a uh, major reason was to go and examine those sites, plus to take some pictures to, to be sure we understood what had happened to them. In the Scorpion's case, uh, some people wrote books and said she'd been torpedoed by uh, the, the uh, Soviets. And, uh, and I wanted to know for sure. Uh, interestingly, the skipper of the Scorpion was my classmate at the Naval Academy. We were on the same staff. He was a wonderful guy. And uh, Fred Stelter. Uh, so I had an interest, a deep interest, to go, go back and look at both of those ships. I, I would imagine, though, Admiral, that you can't just have any kind of submarine go and looking for them. Who was it and what was it that found those submarines, that went looking well, for those submarines? Well, we connected with uh, Bob Ballard, America's underwater explorer, who uh, had, had done all kinds of that operation, uh, operations like that. And uh, so uh, he came and I met with him uh, and we talked to the operation. It was top secret, of course. We didn't want the Soviets to know where we were. Uh, we could uh, clear him as a naval officer. He was a, a commander in the Naval Reserve. And uh, we went through the operation, uh, and uh, he, uh, he said he could do it within the time and the funding that we had. We had to, he had to, to build some things uh, and create some things so they could get down there with this sled, remote control sled, and, and uh, take pictures. Uh, at the end of our discussion, though, it was pretty funny. He said, uh, well, Admiral, I, uh, I've got one more thing I'd like to say to you. He said, all my life I wanted to go find the Titanic. And I was taken aback by that. I said, well, come on, this is a serious top secret operation. Find the Titanic, that's crazy. We're not going to do that. We don't have the money to do that. And then he talked, and he talked. He must, he must have read the book, The Art of the Deal, I don't know. But he, he, he talked about, gee, can't you imagine our, our unmanned submersible coming down the, the, the grand stairway of the uh, Titanic, going into the ballroom, those wonderful pictures? People would uh, be so interested in that. And I said, well, I'm sure they would be. I, I, once again, you know, I can't, we can't do this. I can't go and uh, ask my superiors if we can go look at the Titanic. And, but he kept at me. And so finally I said, I got sick of it. I said, look, Bob, and he's a good friend. Uh, but I said, look, Bob, I said, you can do whatever you want, but you got to do it within the time and within the money. And that's it. He said, OK. So we had a deal. We shook hands on it. Uh, he went out to look for Thresher uh, in uh, 1984 and did a good job uh, uh, checking out the site, uh, photographing uh, the Thresher, 
And what we thought about Thresher was uh, validated there, the fact that uh, she was down at doing a deep dive at 1,300 feet, you know, the height of the Washington Monument. Uh, and uh, they had a, a, a <clears throat> seawater system failure that ruptured. and Tons of water came in, pressure at 1,600 pounds per square inch. The water, of course, went into the electrical panels, shut down the reactor. Uh, they had no propulsion. The air system didn't work, so she had no way to get up, and she was lost. The, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Scorpion uh, uh, site uh, he examined in, in 1985, the fall of 1985. And he did another good job uh, checking out the sites. Neither sites did they find any radioactivity. And uh, he uh, and he finished up. We 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 were able to see from the way the the Soviet the uh, Scorpion was on the bottom. The forward end was an intact. The after end was had imploded. But apparently the forward end had not been hit by any torpedo. They'd had some sort of catastrophic flooding and uh, the ship went down because of that. Probably, uh, in my view anyway, because of a battery explosion. Uh, Was there some doubt among the Navy that there might oh, have yes, been a Oh yes, I, 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 I meant to hit? cover that. Yes, uh, they were, people in the Navy said it was, uh, and, and others who wrote books, said the Soviets, and they had a task group about 200 miles away at the time Scorpion went by that the Soviets had uh, detected her and uh, attacked her and sunk her. Mm -hmm. And uh, others said that they had, she'd been sunk by her own torpedo, that they had a hot run with the, with where a torpedo starts in the torpedo room and, and uh, that's a real mess. You've got to get rid of the torpedo right away. And uh, so, uh, but it looked, it looked, clearly looked from the photography that uh, they'd had a catastrophic flooding incident and it had gone down. I understand that one of the things that really helped Ballard when he was looking for both these subs was the debris field, that he could follow that debris field right to the main yes. source of the, the he, he learned that from his uh, examination of the thresher. He realized that there was about a mile uh, long debris tail behind thresher, and because thresher, the ship itself went down like a stone, but the debris would he picked up by the current, the prevailing current, and ended up as a tail. So he used that finding, and he, he saw the same thing in the, with, when he was examining Scorpion. He used that as his means for going out and looking for Titanic afterwards. Uh, he knew where Titanic was within 30 square miles, I think, but uh, he had to have something better than that, and by going, by Assuming there would be a one-mile tail, he was able to, to find her. Before we get to the main part of the Titanic story, just a couple other quick questions. You were in the Navy at this time. Yes. You were in a submarine fleet at this yes. time when both of these submarines went down. What's yes. the impact in the Navy of yourself and, and Rick Over and all of the other submariners? How do you deal with that? Well, I was aboard a fleet ballistic missile submarine operating off of the Holy Lock the day Thresher went down, we were, we were doing our deep dive. I was a, the chief engineer, and the word came over that, that we lost the Thresher. You know, that message went through the submarine uh, like wildfire. And uh, so we went down and went down in 100-foot increments to get down to the deepest depth we could go. We were only a 700-foot submarine. Thresher was 1,300 feet. Uh, and I remember looking at every pipe and, and valve and everything, very, any drip that I saw, I, 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 we were affected. Uh, the, uh, the Admiral Rickover did a great job, I thought, afterwards. I mean, everybody uh, having all kinds of comments, but we came back from our patrol about uh, a month later and uh, Rickover uh, had already changed the procedures in the operation of submarines, uh, nuclear power plants, 
so that we'd have maximum uh, ability to surface, even though the reactor shut down. And that was quite a change in procedures. And uh, he called all the chief engineers back to Washington. He didn't call the captains. He wanted the guys who were going to have to do it. And we all sat in there and out he came and he personally went over the changes in the procedures that, uh, that he'd authorized, which were quite extensive. And uh, when he finished, he said, did anybody have any questions? All of us were too afraid to, to ask any questions. Uh, yeah, Admiral Rickover was an imposing man. Uh, but, uh, but his reaction was good. I mean, he, he recognized that you had to keep that reactor on the line through anything in order to get the submarine back to the surface. The Navy did a good job, uh, and they established what they called a subsafe program. And this was a, a program to examine every submarine, the hull, all of the equipment in the submarine, all the equipment headed for the submarine, uh, to ensure that the watertight integrity of that submarine was going to be perfect. Very, very extensive, very expensive. But those equipments were always handled separately. They were kept in cages, tagged. I mean, you knew the, the, uh, the background of uh, every valve, every section of piping as they built the ships. And Subsafe, uh, since then, has uh, certainly uh, uh, helped the submarine force. I, I give you one example the submarine San Francisco making 30 knots. That's about 35 miles an hour. Uh, back in 2005, she hit a mountain straight on and uh, com completely demolished the, the bow area where we had the sonar. But the hull uh, was maintained and the ship was able to surface. She was about 200 miles from Guam and she was able to limp into Guam there were some people hurt because they were just thrown all over the place, as you can imagine. But the submarine survived. And uh, that, in my view, was a tribute to Subsafe. Uh, well, getting back to the Titanic, uh, the uh, Ballard was off and, and did his thing in 84, which went well. In 85, he uh, was doing his thing with the uh, Scorpion, and uh, I was in my office, and uh, my chief of staff came in and said, uh, Bob Ballard's on the Marine telephone. He wants to talk with you. And I, I was a little upset. I, you know, I didn't want him to communicate from sea. I didn't want the Soviets to be able to detect him at sea. I said, what do you want? And he very quickly said, we found it. And I said, you found what? been a year since I think I talked to him. He said, well, I can't tell you, but we want to meet you in Portsmouth uh, when we come in and meet with the press and click. And I sat down and I thought for a minute, then I said, my God, we found the Titanic. And I was sh in a state of shock, uh, mainly because I had no authorized program for the Titanic. No funding had been authorized. We had no line item. I had not briefed the Intelligence Committee in the Congress, which we always did on special top secret operations, and certainly we would have briefed them if we were looking for the Titanic. I was really the only one who knew in the Navy that Ballard was out looking for the Titanic. Uh, he had 12 days available to him, and uh, he used them, and he found her. So I went up to see my boss, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Jim Watkins, great guy. He had, I had been his exec when he was skipper of a submarine, Snook. And I went in and I said, uh, Admiral, I've got good news for you and bad news for you. He said, well, what's the good news? I said, we found the Titanic. He said, oh, my God, how wonderful. What's the bad news? I said, we don't have an authorized program to go out and search for her, or authorized funding. I've never briefed anybody in the Congress that we were going to do it. Uh, 
Nobody knew that we were involved. So he thought for a minute, he said, well, you better go tell the Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, a wonderful Secretary of the Navy. He, was, he and, and Reagan together rebuilt our submarine force. But I uh, went into Lehman's office and I said, Mr. Secretary, I've got some good news for you. And he said, what's that? I said, we found the Titanic. He jumped out of his seat. He was so pleased. He said, that's wonderful. He said, I'm going to have to tell the president. I said, well, on top of that, they want you to go to Portsmouth to brief the press. And he said, well, of course I'll do that. And then I slid out of that room before he thought to ask me, what the hell are you doing looking for the Titanic? <laughs> well, afterwards, uh, the decision was made that we would keep it quiet that the Navy was involved that we would make it all Ballard's operation and, uh, and all of the publicity uh, was involved with uh, Ballard, who was a, incidentally a wonderful guy. I've known him for a lot of years. He, initially, just Ballard and I knew where Titanic was and we were gonna treat it like a graveyard and not tell anybody. But the French uh, got after us uh, legally saying, hey, Ballard, You've been out working with us. We provided you information. So from a legal aspect, he had to tell the French. And at that point, then uh, the French were all over it, bringing up curios, et cetera, from the Titanic to sell. Uh, the, uh, somebody made, the, uh, made a, a statement that maybe Ballard shouldn't have told you know, where the ship was. And, and, uh, and I wrote a letter to the National Geographic, which has got a program on this, incidentally. It's called uh, Titanic, The Final Secret. Uh, but I, I wrote a letter to the, the president and said, look, it was not Ballard's idea to release that location. We had to do it from legal problems. So th that's the story. I, uh, the one thing that, it, that really uh, kind of bothers me in my life, so I thought I did some pretty good things in submarines. Nobody remembers any of those, but they remember that I funded the finding of the Titanic. Which, Admiral, you just said you really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember, did you hear what President Reagan's reaction was in hearing this news? Uh, here's a guy who really is savvy about what makes good press. And yes, how yes. To, you know, what's a good story? Yes, well, I, I was not there when he was told by Lehman. Uh, he was very pleased. He, uh, nobody uh, thought to come after me for spending money I didn't have. And that was okay with me. And back then, they put you in jail for that. Today, I'm not so sure that would happen. Uh, but uh, he was very pleased with it. And, uh, and we were, we, uh, again, uh, Reagan, along with Lehman, you know, they built our submarine force that uh, really, I think, took down the Soviets. When I, when I came to the Pentagon in 1981, we were building maybe one submarine a year. When I left in 1985, we were building six a year. And we had a new class on the drawing board. All of that came from Lehman and, uh, the, of course, the president authorizing those, the expenditure of those funds. And in my view, the Soviets saw that and said, there's no way we can keep up with that. And that's what brought down the wall. I wonder if you can just elaborate a little bit more on that, because there's no real conflict between the two submarine fleets. Is it just that's so incredibly expensive for the Soviets and the technology wasn't there on the Soviet side? Well, that was it. It was very expensive to do that. Plus, they didn't have the technology. Uh, it later turned out that uh, we were trailing their submarines. Uh, they didn't know it, of course. Uh, they found out about it uh, through communications that they'd intercepted. and. Uh, I'm sure their submarine skippers were getting slapped around for not being able to deal with uh, the American submarines. Was there a benefit 
from finding the Thresher and the Scorpion technologically for the U.S. Navy? Well, the, the Thresher, of course, we found that they were using the wrong uh, system to bring uh, seawater system joints together. They were using silver brazing and they weren't uh, requiring enough bond and that's, that was eliminated. Uh, in our submarines today, we have welded joints. And all of our submarines were checked out as part of the subsafe program, all of the hulls. I had a problem in my submarine, which was not unlike the threshers in the salt water system. It had to go anyway, and uh, the, uh, they limited uh, me to uh, 400 feet. I remember when the squadron commander told me that, that uh, I said, yes, sir, and turned around and walked out of his office. I was in Guam. He called me and he said, hey, Ron, watch your ass, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I sure did. I, uh, Rickover, I don't think ever, ever uh, forgot the thresher. When, when I, you know, we all had to go to command in Admiral Rickover's offices for, I had to go for, for a time in Admiral Rickover's offices for about three months before we went to command. And uh, we had to study the propulsion plants and, and to really have a good knowledge of the ship. And uh, I was selected to go command the plunger. Plunger had had some problems. And uh, so he called me in to, to send me off. and. Uh, uh, essentially, he said, you know, I want you to be sure you watch what you're doing and uh, that you're following procedures. You're a cowboy. And uh, I don't know why he thought I was a cowboy, but uh, those were his words. So, but that was always in the back of my mind when I was about to embark on something that was, I thought, kind of slick. I would come back to my, come to my mind about, well, let's think about it again before we go off and do it. A couple more questions that brings us back to the Titanic again. Mm -hmm. What is it about that disaster, do you think, that so fascinated, fascinates the public? Well, I think it's the horror of those people, uh, so many of them, you know, 1,500 people were lost in the Titanic. Uh, and uh, the horror, the stories of uh, the band playing as the ship went down, the stories of men dressing like women in order to get in the boats. I mean, there's a, there's a hundred stories there. And people, I think, imagining themselves as being part of that, the horror of it. I, I, uh, I've often wondered if, they, if the people had ever thought of themselves on a submarine that went down, you know, the, the last two or three minutes before the submarine imploded. Uh, in Thresher's case, I think there was about three minutes, we, from what I can see. In the, so those sailors knew they were going to their death? Some of them did. Some of the guys were in there fighting, trying to get control of the flooding, but some of them were just there knowing something's going wrong and we're going down. I uh, had one occasion in my sub, when I was an exec on the snook, and we were running at around 400 feet at uh, 25 knots. And we had just worked on our fair water plane system. Uh, we, we were out in Okinawa. We were out testing it. And the fair water planes on their own just went down full dive. And the boat, of course, lurched forward. It took a pretty good angle, maybe 20, 25 degrees. And uh, everybody in the attack center did the right thing. No, nobody was clutched. I mean, it was all back emergency, right full rudder, squat the stern, uh, full rise on the stern planes. I mean, and we, we were going down. You could see the depth gauge going down. And um, there was a young guy in the bow planes. I'll never forget him. And he was sat there very quietly. And, and there was no other noise in the attack center. We were all watching this depth gauge. And he was saying, we're going down. We're going down. We're going down. And then all of a sudden, this depth gauge stopped. And he said, hooray, we're going up. <laughs> I'll never, never forget it. But, but, you know, for a little bit there, I wasn't sure we were going to pull out of it. 
I can see it be a lot worse on the Thresher and certainly on the Scorpion. Scorpion must have had a terrible flooding incident. And uh, they, uh, of course, sealed off the after end of the boat and the people in the after end went down and of course they were killed in the implosion where the, the compartment is actually squashed like a can. Is that the same thing that happened to the Titanic then? There was an implosion? I don't think so because she was not a sealed. She was a flooding. There was flooding uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. that went through the ships. Remember, it went from compartment to compartment because they, they didn't have the, the doors shut. Uh, I, I can't recall what, what I remember in the movie, but she uh, uh, supposedly the, sh that the Titanic was designed where that couldn't happen that they could seal off the compartments. It turned out they weren't able to. There you go. Don't predict that it's an unsinkable ship. That's right. That's right. The, uh, but that was the purpose of Subsafe, was to create a program that would ensure that the, the watertight integrity in the submarine. And uh, that's worked so far. You mentioned the movie. Admiral, what did you think of the movie? Well, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I... Uh, my wife makes me watch uh, all the movies uh, from way back when. I remember the first Titanic movie, which was pretty good. The one in the 50s? Yes. And, uh, well, I, I, it may have been earlier than that. I don't know. But, uh, but the movie was, uh, was, was quite a Hollywood event. Uh, the, uh, but the story, uh, you know, and I've, I've read a lot of other stories about ships and uh, with problems, submarines with problems. That's, you know, it was one of the things that I did when I went to submarine command. Uh, I read all of the war patrol reports, World War II, of our submarines. And it was the best thing I ever did because they went through everything. They had every problem. And they, in the reports, they were able to describe what they did. And uh, so when it came my time, uh, I was able to react in the right way when I had problems. Uh, and when I was an executive officer, we had, uh, we had a serious problem. I, I thought half the men in the submarine were dead from thousands of parts per million of carbon dioxide. A wrong material had been put into a piece of equipment, not, not by the crew, but the manufacturer had, had put the wrong material into a box and labeled it one thing and it was something else. I won't go through the technology. But uh, that immediately caused uh, this uh, carbon dioxide and uh, we had half the submarine down. One guy treating another guy using an airline breathing mask, trying to pump air into him because he'd gone down and it was... Uh, it was quite an experience. The one thing I learned from that, I was the executive officer, as I say, you know, submariners are wonderful. There wasn't any panic. If people were, were doing what they could to take care of their buddies using this system that they invented, which was to take an airline breathing mask and put it on the guy's face, take a pencil and put it into the regulator, pump him up with air. And uh, we didn't lose anybody. We all had bad headaches, I'll tell you that. You uh, mentioned a few minutes ago that you've had this amazing career dealing with submarines for most of your life. It's been an awful lot of months underneath the water, yeah. and yet the only thing that people are interested in, it seems like, is the, uh, the Titanic story. The Titanic, that's right. What would you like to be remembered for, Admiral? Well, I, I'd like to remember, be remembered as a, a good submarine skipper, a professional skipper, took care of my crew, brought them home, and uh, that's, that's the most important thing to me. Any last words about the Titanic experience? <clears throat> no, uh, uh, one, one other funny thing. Uh, Owsley and I went to England and we were in Portsmouth and uh, there was a hotel and they were having a Titanic, uh, a meeting of their Titanic society. The hotel was full of these people who were in this society. Of course, we weren't part of that. We were there for other reasons. And uh, we went into the hotel and, and they had a big reception and people all around. And 
a lady, a lady said to me, she said, uh, oh, do you know about the Titanic? And we realized I was an American. And, you know, I, I said it wrong, but I said, I found it. And she looked at me and walked off. <laughs> <laughs> but you did. <laughs> you were there. I was there. Thank you very much. Admiral. Okay. All right. Fun. My pleasure. Thank you for coming today.